watching a viewer's choice. So for today I picked some interesting games that were sent by the YouTube viewers and I'm going to share them both with the audience here as well as with the audience online. So we'll get started with a game uh, that was played between the anonymous GM and, uh, well, I don't know if I should read some of these names because I'm worried, you know, the names might sound strange. But anyways, <laughs> the guy, the <laughs> uh, so King Koi Mac. So uh, Brad has white in this position. He's the one, well, in this game, and he's the one who sent the game. And he said that he's just over 1700 and he played this game, he finished this game in 12 moves. So considering that today we're also going to have for the uh, people here in class, we're going to have the games, you know, famous games that everyone should know, I figured that uh, this is a cool game as well. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of a fast game and he beat the 1900. So let's get started and see what Black did wrong and, um, and uh, what pattern uh, Brad has chosen to, to win this game, actually to mate. So e6, nothing out of the ordinary so far, d4, and now d6. Now this is something that you don't typically see played, especially if, you know, like he said, his opponent was 1900, you don't typically expect them to play this way because of course it's very important to get the control over the center, but um, some of you who have the knowledge of, uh, you know, uh, how chess uh, openings have changed through time, you know that, you know, a hyper-modern is something that um, uh, is being played nowadays, let's, let's say it that way, like uh, we don't occupy the center immediately, we try to develop on the sides and then we're going to attack the center and it all comes back from Nimzovic on. So it's not too bad, right? Uh, what kind of systems could come out of these, you know, e6 and d6? What do you guys think? Uh, hippopotamus, modern. Yeah, some modern, like uh, Hippopotamus, uh, Pyrrhic, well, Pyrrhic typically is not played with e6, you have the knight in f6, but there are some ideas that black play, you know, with g6, b6, basically try to develop their bishops like that, something like that, and then eventually they'll play uh, with c5 or maybe f5. And um, it seems quite all right so far. Okay, maybe it's not the typical thing, but not too bad. c4. And now I was a little bit um, surprised that really um, when white chooses such an active you know, approach, you, you might want to reconsider your choices. You know, you want to try to find a way to play c5 fast. So black played knight e7, knight c3, c6. I wouldn't really recommend this to anyone, you know. What do you guys think? Is this something that you've seen in 1900? Me neither, so I was a little bit confused. And white, what should white do? I mean, let's say you get to play against an opponent who just thinks that they can not occupy the center and just push the pawns, a bunch of pawns in the opening uh, without actually. I'd like to play f4 in this situation. Maybe f4, maybe f4 would work. But if not just development, you know, like if somebody plays an opening that you're not familiar with, you should just try to develop your pieces um, in a normal fashion and uh, yeah, like, of course, occupy the center, which is exactly what White did. He played bishop g5 here. I'm not sure if this would be the move that I would choose. Knight c3 is, uh, knight f3, I'm sorry, is another option. Of course, f4, like someone in the audience said. So, okay, but bishop g5, queen c7, exiting from the, from the pin. Knight f3, knight g6. If we try to evaluate this position, what, what would you say about it? Or what would you play here with white to continue? Well, black's yes. Black's moved this knight twice. He's not developed. So I develop another piece and keep playing the castle. Yeah, and just develop it. another piece, castle. Or you can say, yes, this knight has been moved twice. Knight e7, knight g6. Black has only developed the queen. Maybe we can even consider some attack with h4, you know? 
because this knight, this is not such a great square for the knight. Considering I didn't castle yet, I can castle long any time. You haven't attacked the center just yet, and you are underdeveloped. So this would be really fantastic for white, I believe, and you know, I, I would consider doing that. Or maybe you would consider any of the moves that I have on the screen, like bishop d3, queen d2, you know, just to finish the development and kind of show that you're going to eventually castle on the um, queen side because certainly something is going to happen on the king side, considering that black did develop that knight there. It's probably the place where he will castle. But our, um, the person, uh, Brad, played the rook to c1. Now I have nothing against this move. It's always nice to place your rook on the same file as your opponent's queen, but you're not really utilizing all the advantages that you're getting from the fact that black messed up his, he's not, I mean, just messed up the development. So it's not a bad move, but by playing rook c1, you're basically giving up your choices of castling long. So probably you either castle short or stay with the king in the center, and you're, you're really not having a serious threat on the C file, right? So try to avoid, in, this, is, this would be my advice, try to avoid making decisive, um, yeah, decisive moves that don't give you flexibility. It's always important to, um, especially if your opponent doesn't follow the regular uh, path of development, try to make moves that give you fl a flexibility and various ideas. Do not show them exactly what it is that you want to do. So I don't, see, I don't think this move is bad. It's just losing some of the flexibility that, that uh, white has. E5, what do we think about this move? Well, but white has the king uncastled as well in the center. Black needs to find a way to eventually uh, attack the center. And this is, this is a possible way. You know, it's kind of waste. He has wasted a little bit of time by playing e6, e5. But it is necessary for black to attack the center. Of course, there are some other ways to finish the development. But here, um, because the knight is in g6, protects e5, we don't really have tricks to take in e5 and checkmate there or something because, you know, we would need to, to take in e5 first and he's, he's protected. So, yes? Someone want to say something? No? Okay. d5, yes. This is a natural move that uh, the white has, trying to get the space. And in this position, why would you play with black? So you messed up a little bit the opening, um, but now it seems like you're getting some old Indian style positions. What would you do? Maybe better ask you what would you not do for sure. Don't take. Don't take. <laughs> right then? Because perfectly, white has perfectly placed the rook on the C file for you not to take. So then what, do, what should we do with black? Bishop e7, yes, certainly. I mean, or h6. It, it's up to you if you want to trade a bishop or chase this bishop away first. You know, the bishop would go back and then bishop e7, for example. And, okay, you've lost a little bit of time, but somehow, you know, you're getting a pretty nice position. And uh, if white takes here, with which piece would you consider capturing back? to control that square. Normally, we would like to take with a knight and place it in d4, but here y you might want to avoid knight d5. So with a pawn, and the fact that the rook is on the c file doesn't really help white very much, right? It, he was unable to, to actually open up the file for the rook. So now white will have to find a way to bring the rook on the d file. But anyways, uh, white is not really forced to take, right? White can finish the development, but so here, um, like I said, like h6, bishop e7 is probably what I would consider to play with black. But in this position, black played c5. So already two moves down, e6, e5, c6, e5. This cannot be good. 
this cannot be good. Um, so what did I do? Now it's about utilizing the fact that the king is in the center, but you don't actually utilize it because the file is open, but you utilize another typical idea. The diagonal. So somebody said knight, knight, good, knight b5. And here, uh, black made it pretty easy. He played queen d7. I mean, it's, it's a very, very difficult, it probably was a very painful loss for black because, I mean, you, you already moved so many pieces and now you're also putting the queen in front of the bishop. I mean, this is just not right. I'm not saying that after this, black would have been okay, but at least you keep your bishop open. I mean, you cannot play with no space and also restricting uh, the only space that you have for your bishop. Probably queen a4 would have followed, but now you can play bishop d7 and, uh, and not lose too, too fast. But black played queen d7. White finished the development, bishop d3. And in this position, black kind of blundered. Well, small mistake, a6. What do we do? Say again, please. Queen a4. <laughs> and uh, well, that is a pin. You cannot take my knight. And what is my threat? Mate mate and it's mate rook so you you really have no no chance of actually stopping the mate and stopping the capture of the rook too maybe you could have taken the knight but black played h6 here after knight c7 the game was over so it was a pretty I, I found this a really nice game so I thought I would share it but it clearly shows why should why you should really be respecting the principles. Or if you're trying to play something different, some modern uh, type of opening, try to still respect the principles. I mean, there's still this idea of development. You cannot really do what you want and expect to get a good position. So, you know, and as you could see, it took a really long time for white to actually get into a winning position. White was better all the way, but it wasn't until black played c5 that the position got uh, pretty bad. So you can sometimes survive by making a lot of mistakes, but... Um, Look at black's back row. Yeah, <laughs> pretty bad, huh? Most of the pieces there, and this knight in g6 didn't turn out to do very much. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this game. Let's save it in case at some point we'll use it for something. So we have some other interesting games. Um, let's go for this draw. This is a pretty interesting game. Oh, do you know, do you know whose game this is? Or do, are you happy that it's a draw? Sure, draw. <laughs> it's a draw, OK. Well, um, so I'll just leave this here for a second to read what our uh, viewer said. So he said, I would like to submit this game for review. I was playing with the white pieces against my friend, who is an average of 300 ELO above me since we first met. So he says he's been working on his draws, but OK, this one, this game still turned out to be a draw. And um, it, it was a pretty interesting game. So let's get started with it. I'll put it on training so we can get to get some of the moves. OK, so g3. So OK, by the way, I didn't say the name. So it was played between Anis and Cat Girl something. Journey. G3, D5, Bishop G2, Knight C6. Somehow it turned out that for today some of the games were, you know, modern. Um, but that's okay, you know. I want to show that it's possible to play these types of openings. You just need to make sure you res still respect the principles. Knight F3, E5. What do we do here with White? Well, if you play this, you need to be careful for this move. So. Typically, d3. But in this position, white played e3. d4 is another option. 
but D3 typically is something that, that white plays, will get a ready style position or reverse Kings Indian kind of, so, or modern. Okay, white played E3. Why is this kind of a dubious choice? Because, yeah, I mean, you know, black has a threat. We have to always consider what our opponent wants to do, including the openings, especially in the openings. And especially in these types where there isn't a clear theory or, well, in this one there is, but. Okay, so e3, e4, knight e4, knight takes d4. Now, this move, although it does give black some kind of, you know, maybe edge, say, because white gets the pawns doubled, these pawns are not really weak. So you have to always consider, am I really weakening my opponent's pawns, or it's just a trade like any other? And here, this is not a weakness in, in, by any means, because white will always have the option to play d3 and trade the double pawn, and everything will be fine. So if black wants to keep some advantage here, knight e5 is in my opinion, a better choice because this knight in d4 is going to be chased away later. So black will try to get a little bit more space and we did chase away the knight from, from the king side. So um, I remember when I normally play bullet or, or blitz online, um, I did lose a lot of games because at some point, you know, I had the pre-move and I forgot to push d3 and I would either lose my knight because I forgot and I would try to castle <laughs> or I would allow these h5s, h4s, and, and sometimes I would lose. But here we're not talking about that. You know, those are just for fun. I really would like to mention that. Uh, but anyways, uh, these are good positions for black. But in this game, black took in d4, pawn takes, not f6. What do we do with white? Castle, of course, finishing the development. Bishop e7, knight c3. I probably would have gone for d3 immediately, considering the fact that there's no bishop in f5 that would stop me from capturing back with the queen. But knight c3 was the move played by white. Bishop e6. These are some other interesting ideas that, um, that I've seen played uh, previously. They don't always get give you um, black a lot of play, but still it is annoying when, when you're kind of forced to play rookie, queen e1 and uh, um, it's just a development move with tempo, then queen d7 can, can be played for black and you can try to trade the bishop. So you made a development move with tempo. Um, you typically like to look for those kind of things. But black just chose to develop the bishop quietly in e6. Of course, you have similar ideas, but now you're not forcing white to move the queen. d3, now bishop g4. f3, what do you think? Was this a nice choice by white, or should he, he have done something else? Or maybe it was she, maybe there are two girls. I'm not quite sure. From the names, maybe what do you guys think? Maybe I should say she instead of he. Okay, it doesn't matter. So queen d2? Yeah, maybe, so that you can take with the queen. Yeah. But f3 is an interesting choice too because white is trying to open up the bishop. But the bishop was going to be opened up anyways this way, so that's why I would probably go for queen d2. But f3 was the move played, and bishop c8. It's not such a great choice by black, right? Mm -hmm. Considering the rating which black had here, 1566, this is not the type of move that we want to play. What should black do, of course? Just simply take. I mean, leave those two pawns doubled. They're not weak, but at least they are doubled, and so you will have a majority on the on the king side, whereas white's majority on the queen side will be kind of blocked because of the double pawns. This is this is a typical idea that we encounter uh, normally in uh, Rui Lopez. Well, 
in the exchange variation of the royal offense. The bishop takes c6, and black normally has the messed up um, uh, uh, majority. OK, bishop takes f3. Bishop, a oh, sorry. That was my line, <laughs> what I thought black should do. And now you can go back if you want, or you can trade the bishop, either one. Depends wh whether you want to attack or not. But in this position, black played bishop c8. So what did white do? Take with the d pawn, of course. And now we have a little advantage with the pawn up. So white is starting to get a better position, right? So it was pretty good. Our um, uh, viewer, or well, the person who submitted the game certainly was happy in this position with the extra advantage. Um, and was able to even get more advantage, but unfortunately was not able to convert the game. So let's continue and see what happened. E5, I like this move because you're getting more space and you can certainly consider some attack on the king side now that you have also an extra pawn. And Knight of eight, next move. What should next move for white be? F4 is an option, and if you don't want this pawns to be doubled for some... 92, somebody said? Ah, you want 92? Yeah, maybe, because he doesn't have space. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Queen D3 was my, the move I was thinking about, but uh, 92 might be nicer, because if black tries to play in a French type of style with C5, you have C3, right? So, okay. But f4 was played, so going for the attack, not caring about this. I mean, we take back, and then this bishop can be developed here, of course. And then we also have the same kind of idea with queen d3 and c4. Black played 97. h3. Well, to be surprising, if you want to play g4, you can just go for it right now. So didn't quite understand this move. Um, h3, castle, knight e2, preparing some stuff. But also this knight is always nice. Uh, I, I always liked uh, positions where the opponent didn't have so much space and um, it wasn't so clear where the bishops would go. So you have sometimes maneuvers that you don't let them take your knight anymore and just bring them on the other side. Like if white ever plays f5, you can bring the knight in f4 or or if you, if you push g4, you can also bring it here. So depending on where you want to go next, h5, or try to put pressure in d5, that's all. those ideas, I love them. Uh, for some of you who are familiar with the uh, Benoni, white has plans to bring this knight from f3 to d2, c4, right? Those are nice ideas because you are, you are not allowing black to play bishop g4 and take your knight and you're bringing the knight to put some pressure on d6 and, and sometimes stop, uh, stop ideas with b5. But OK, those are other openings for another time. c5, c3, bishop a5, bishop d2. Now we can really tell the fact that you know white was not a very strong player. But what I like about it is that he or she did follow the, the development patterns, did finish the, the development, but not bishop d2, you know? If you want to develop this bishop, you need to try to be a little bit more active. This is not such a nice place where you're actually stopped by a pawn. Of course, if you're thinking that your opponent, after bishop d2, your opponent would take in d4, right? You take back, then that bishop will be traded or finally will have a diagonal, that's a wishful thinking only you know you you cannot think that way in chess you need to consider some better choices for your opponent and right you can take because it's a free pawn you can take it if you want but if not if you want to develop the bishop more like here will be the place and you're not worried about knight f5 because the bishop goes to f2 because your pawn is up the bishop in f2 is uh, that's a famous type of idea that you encounter from King's Indians, right? Your bishop gets to retreat and 
and then you start pushing that knight back. G4, F5, you know. So D2 is a little bit too passive. Black was very nice to take, and white chose to take with the knight, but of course, this was another option to try to actually get rid of the bishop. But maybe white thought, okay, black has less space, I will not trade a piece. I could not tell you exactly what, what was uh, white's idea. Knight takes d4, rook b8. What is black's plan after rook b8? I think it's kind of clear. Try to push the pawns on the queen side, create some plan. I mean, it's tough when you're playing with a pawn down, but you, need, you cannot give up. You should never give up in chess. Your opponent can always make mistakes. So, rook f3. What about just f5? Yeah. Uh, immediately. Yeah, this is nice. Um, yeah, because now you have f6. f6, yeah. And if I play f6, what do you do? Yeah, you can push e6 and then go with this pawn. You also have bishop f4. Yeah, maybe immediately f5 would have been a... It's a pretty tough position for black. Rook f3 is a little bit strange, but why does prepare for the attack? b5, now b4. f5 once again, of course. Um, we are often tempted when we see that our our opponent is attacking on one side of the board, we're often tempted to stop them. But I think you have to figure out where, on which side of the board you're attacking. Recently I played a game um, where my opponent was going to attack me on the king side and I, was going, I had a really big advantage on the queen side, so I started there. And for some reason I panicked and I thought that there will be some attacking idea on the king side, I should stop it. But instead of stopping it, I actually weaken my king more. When, you're, when you are the one attacking on the king side and your opponent attacks on the queen side, I mean, let's just say king side is already, you know, castle, so let's assume that. Uh, you really don't need to do too much on the queen side. Uh, you can just go on with your attack unless you see that you're going to lose some material. Uh, because you know, if your attack works and you, you make the right moves towards improving it and make it work, you are going to finish the game much faster than they are on the queen side. Because typically, how does it happen? It, they attack and they try to come, you know, around because they cannot play on the side that you are playing. So, um, yeah, before is a little bit of a. Um, it's not really necessary, so it will help black a little bit, get the bishop on a better position, and then play a5. But still, it's not a mistake, because after bishop b6, uh, bishop e3, white still has the plan with f5. It just needs a little bit more time now. You know, because, of course, because of the pin, we cannot push f5. So we have to protect it first, and now we can still not play f5. We need to probably play g4, and then f5. So. It basically slowed white down. And you said he couldn't play f5 much earlier in the game. Yes, yes. Twice, two or three moves in a row, white could have played f5. But now it's not so simple anymore. Bishop f2, so <laughs> um, it is possible that our viewer was familiar with bishop uh, e3, bishop f2 idea, but maybe thought the rook should be placed better in f3 which I don't really agree that the rook is better placed in f3. What do you do with the rook? You need flexibility when you have rooks. And uh, you either are going to push the f-pawn and make your rook really flexible, like be able to come attack, or you keep it in f1 because you will be placing it in e1 and maybe play e6 and open up the e-file. But this way is a little bit strange, but, black you know. Black could play f5 here. Black could play f5 here? Um, yes, and 
in amending the e pawn's pass, but you know. Mm, no, I'm thinking to actually take. Uh -huh. Rook takes. Mm -hmm. And now maybe I can push. Or queen somewhere first. Maybe I can just push d4. I have ideas with bishop h4. I just need to make sure nothing will happen because of this pin. Maybe king h1 at some point is helpful. If I want to attack the king side, I can still go for it. Um, yeah. But black play bishop d7, finishing the development, g4, knight c6. Now again, f5, wait, f5, yeah, knight takes a pawn. But rook d3, you know, white changed the plans. First it looked like they are going to play on the queen's, king side, attacking. And now it's going back for the weakness in d5. You need to kind of make up your mind what is it that you want to do. Here it happened to have worked, but in other cases, switching plans like this for no specific reason is not such a great idea. So knight takes d4, bishop takes, bishop e6, f5, very good. And now queen e2. Um, now this is a permanent weakness for black, of course, it's been there for some time, but now white um, is going to, to try to still improve the position of their pieces before taking it. Uh, this was of course another possibility. And then king somewhere. Just, you know, you're, when you know you're going to go for a pawn and open up diagonals and things, you need to make sure your king will be safe. And with the push of these pawns, it doesn't, I mean, it's still winning for white. It just, it's not the right way to go because you can give counterplay to the opponent. And that was the reason why eventually in this game, white did not win. So queen e2, rook e8, of course, creating some threats. And now queen f2. And um, this is a mistake. Queen e3 was a better choice. Why did not realize that this pin could not be in their favor? So you have to play queen e3 because the queen here, you know, st stops the pin there, but also keeps this pawn protected. Um, and also, you know, offers the same thing as with the queen in f2, some trades in b6, and white having an extra pawn is going to go for an endgame where he will not have to worry about their king anymore because if we trade queens and we win this pawn, we'll have two extra pawns, nobody will get to our king to mate us. But after queen f2, white allowed the capture in e5, which black took, and now it's not so easy anymore. Queen f4, now bishop takes b6 was another option. Rook takes and now What can we do with white? Which one? Rook takes d5 or rook d1? I heard some rook d1, rook takes d5. Bishop takes, I'm assuming, right? Um, to be careful for some entrances here and your king didn't trade queens yet. You can survive, but why why allow this, you know? You can just play queen d4. Just 
take that pawn only when you know that you're not going to give too much, too much counterplay. For example, if black plays rook e2 here, what do we do with white? Let's take the pawn, no? Because now the queens get traded off the board and the other rook will no not be able, we will not let the other rook get on the second rank. Um, anyway, so my line that I had here, queen d4, queen c7, and now just take the pawn. And I think white still has a big advantage. Um, the queen in d3 proves to be a nice piece right now because it controls the GC g3 square, so black's queen will not be able to create any threats for the moment. Uh, but in the game, after rook takes e5, white played queen f4, going for this kind of skewer, but unfortunately, you know, it's not so simple because uh, if black would have played queen c7, there's no threat, like you cannot actually take the rook, it's just, it's just one threat. Um, but we can go s king h1 and then we're threatening the rook and Eventually that pawn will be gone. We also still have some f6 ideas, but okay, not as strong as before, but still pretty nice ideas. In this position, after queen f4, black blundered. And white took the rook, of course. Wait, it's not over, things have changed. <laughs> so this proves to everyone that you should, uh, first you should never give up, and also when you're winning, you need to focus even more than before because it's in those moments that you can lose it, you know, and, and uh, although I teach this all the time, don't think that it doesn't happen to me too. Uh, actually, recently I played a game and I was winning and I thought everything is fine and I just blundered something, so went from winning to losing. That's, that's very painful, so when you're winning, you have to give it your best shot to, to actually, uh, you know, convert the position. Bishop c7. And like I said, uh, white blunder here, bishop b6. You know, I don't know what was in, in, uh, in, our, opponent, in our viewer's mind, right? Bishop b6 is just giving up material. After queen a8, there's not so much that black can do because obviously this is not, uh, this is a great idea, but it, you're just giving up <laughs> material easily, right? So you don't want to do that, and I don't see any ideas that black could have that actually would work. I mean, I can also take here next and, right, it's over, it's an extra rook. But white blundered, so it's, it's fun to see these games. I, I don't know how, how fun it is for you guys, I hope it is. But it's in a way fun because, you know, you're, you are, um, depending on your level, you see some stuff that maybe you wouldn't do, but then there's still things that you can learn, so. Um, anyways, uh, bishop b6, bishop takes with check, king h1, and now uh, black played bishop h5, I think, uh, sorry, pawn h5, uh, bishop c7 of course was, was something else that black would do, and now you have that bishop at least, and uh, still after queen a8 you have to, to be careful not to play queen d6, but you can uh, you can now maybe play h6 or something. And still pretty bad. But at least you can try. Black played h5, trying to open up somehow like this maybe. Rook takes d5, queen there, rook f1. There's no threat. Don't be scared by ghosts. There's no threat here. Just queen takes b6, a free piece that, that black is giving away. And why I want this bishop and not the other one? Because I want my queen to make sure that, you know, I'm not scared of, of attacks or whatever could happen here, uh, or perpetual check. Nothing is going to happen. For example, if black takes here, what do we do? We just check and trade the queens, and it's over. Very simple. Rook f1. White got scared for some reason. Rook e1. 
But you know, like, just look for threats. Look for, because often your opponent will not resign in a lost position. So what you need to do is make sure that uh, they actually have something serious, like some serious threats. If not, just, you know, play your game. Go for the material. Go for the mate, whatever. But, but you know, don't, don't, get, don't get freaked out because, you know, I mean, even if you're playing against a strong player, there's this tendency that, you know, when somebody plays against somebody who's, let's say, three, four hundred points more, you think they calculated everything. If you see something and, you know, you don't see a, a way for your opponent to actually counter that, just go for, your, go for your line. I mean, go for your line. Okay, maybe they did see more than you, but typically, you know, we're all... We're all making mistakes, so it's just a matter of time. Okay, rookie one, white took, which is of course a great thing. Now we have an extra rook. All we have to be careful for is to make sure that black doesn't have a perpetual or some mating idea, which they don't. But white, instead of trying to, actually I shouldn't have pressed the button. Um, but here, we look at this king, right? And it has no place to go, and we just need to find a way to attack it. Does black have anything? The only thing that they have right now is capture the rook with check, bishop takes, and then they need to play queen g3 or queen f2 to actually have a threat, right? So there's no direct threat besides this check, which is not actually a th big thing. So we have to think about how to get to that king. This is the most beautiful way to do it, f6. You open up your rook, and it's going to be over. Because if black plays g6, for example, what do we do? But if you're really scared, if you're really scared, let's just save this. Nothing. Nothing hanging. But instead, white played this move, which was kind of strange, queen b8. And now, things went south. Because check, queen f2, and what do you do? Because obviously this queen h2 does not work because you're going to get mated. So this is the only move. But now it went from white winning to black winning. Or draw. I mean, black has draw, but I think black can actually try to play for a win. Check. Queen f2 check, king h1, takes the rook, of course. And in this position, I, I really think if somebody wants to play for black for win, it would be black. Because your king is messed up. And I will always have checks in such a way that I'm going to win at least one, but probably two of your pawns. And um, so basically here, white got lucky. Play g takes h5. I mean, if you want to try to save yourself, maybe you should try some queen b7. But um, how, how, does what, how does black continue here? Which pawn would you, would you take? Would you take this one? Would you go for this one? Or would you take here? B pawn, okay, and then if you take the B pawn, don't you worry that I'll take the F pawn and then have at least perpetual? I, I think it's safe. I think it's safe to take the one check. I think you should go for this one, yeah. yeah. A king here. Now because now you take with a check, with check, and if they want to play queen g2, what do we do? Trey, king and pawn end game should be winning because you have your pass pawn on the queen side. So queen g3, and now this is nice. Check. And now? Come on, guys, look at this king. It has no queen exits. F, queen f4. Yeah, well, actually, queen f4 so immediately does not. You're right, because then you can play king h4. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the way. But you queen g3 first. Because now you want to take and there. And if I push h4, for example, then you can go there. 
um, <laughs> and I have to, if I have to play this move, it's very painful, you know? I mean, yeah. you want your queen to be active, give checks, capture material. If you have to retreat just to save your king, D yeah, yeah, it's just should be over soon, very soon. So, this would have been a nice ending for black, but uh, black here didn't go for that pawn. Well, white also took in h5, but still, queen a1, queen a2, you want to try to get as many pawns as possible. Instead, black gave this check and took that pawn. Look, in a queen endgame, you have to try to get the pawns that are going to give you the most uh, active ideas, or you're going to try to create a pass pawn for yourself, basically. Here, if we look at this position, if we look at white's pawns on the king side, these pawns are messed up. And white cannot create any kind of threat with the pawns this way. Only if white manages to take the pawn in f7, then they will have some ideas, at least perpetual, right? Or some f6, h6 stuff, and really have something. But these pawns do not threaten black. So black should go for those, because then they will have the past pawns that are going to be, to be threatening white. So this was, this was not such a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just like uh, here, it's not so simple to get all of them with check. But that's why that's why Queen A one was was necessary because now I can try to go to go up and you won't be able to actually take them with check I think or maybe you can if you if you try to give a check like here maybe and then if I go to on anywhere in the first rank there will be Queen B one taking the pawn if I go somewhere here for example maybe you can go this way. And then, yeah, maybe I'll be able to actually get the pawn. Oopsie. But black was pretty nice. Took this pawn. Now queen f4, retreating. Queen e2. But now, king g3, if you go for that pawn, which black did, white has a draw. Check. And that's how the game ended. So, you know, white played a really nice game with an advantage and everything, and then at some point something happened. They got scared, failed to convert a, mu a completely winning position with an extra rook, and that was it. So I think these, these were nice games that we saw today. Hopefully you enjoyed them.